So thanks a lot for having me, everybody. Um, as she mentioned, uh, my name is Nathan Chancellor. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, using Clang and LLVM to build the Linux kernel. Um, so just a little bit of uh, background about me personally. Um, I've been an upstream kernel contributor since 2018. Um, I have about 950 patches or so um, upstream. Um, I started formally uh, maintaining the LLVM build support in the kernel in 2021. Um, I've been uh, contributing to it since about 2018 then. Um, and then I do also have these slides up uh, on my website uh, so that people can uh, follow along and make sure that they are uh, that they can click all the links and everything. Um, so a uh, bit of an agenda for today. Uh, the first thing is I'm gonna give a little primer on what LLVM is in general, um, give uh, some details about the pieces of it, um, how it works, um, why you might wanna use it, um, and then how to build it, how to use it to specifically build the Linux kernel. Um, we have some nice things in Kbuild to make working with this um, and switching your entire, entire tool chain over a little easier. Um, I'm going to give more information about why you would even want to do this in the first place um, and some of the benefits um, that come along with it. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, fixing issues that are encountered with LLVM, um, maybe some warnings and some other problems that might come up from some of the other features that we have in the kernel, um, as well as talk about the features uh, in the kernel that work due to LLVM. Um, So uh, the LLVM project is uh, on, according to them at least, is a collection of modular and reusable compiler and toolchain technologies. At least to me, that kind of sounds like a whole bunch of uh, mumbo jumbo. So ultimately to the end user, um, it's going to be a toolchain uh, that contains a C compiler, um, a linker, an assembler, and some other binary utilities uh, to uh, work with uh, these, these files. Um, the big uh, thing that LLVM prides itself on is that it is modular and reusable, uh, which allows somebody to potentially write uh, a language front end, we'll call it, um, that ingests whatever language of your choice. Uh, we'll see a C language front end. So it takes uh, C in, uh, and then it gains access to powerful language independent optimizations uh, and easy code generations for many architectures. Uh, so LLVM is kind of, uh, you could say, an optimizer and a backend um, that various languages can hook into uh, to gain all of these uh, independent optimizations and code generation. Uh, LLVM does not support as many architectures as GCC does. Uh, so that's something that you will commonly hear come up uh, when people uh, want to maybe switch over to LLVM full time. Uh, is that they might lose access to certain uh, architectures. And we'll kind of talk about um, what architectures we support in the kernel um, and, and how those will work. Um, so you can kind of see an overview here of the, uh, the tool chain pieces together. So uh, for the GNU tool chain, we have the uh, C compiler, which is GCC. Uh, we have their assembler, which is just AS or GNU AS, you might hear it referred to. Um, the linker is LD or GNU LD. Uh, and then we have the GNU bin utils um, or binary utilities um, for manipulating and working with object files. Um, and then for LLVM, we have basically the same pieces available to us. For uh, LLVM, their C compiler is Clang. Um, the, uh, the assembler is integrated. So that means that it's not a standalone binary like for GCC with GCC assembling it uh, builds a command of, uh, or it builds an assembler command and then calls that externally. For LLVM, uh, everything is in memory. So uh, it is integrated into the binary. Um, it doesn't need to shell out to a separate, uh, or doesn't need to call out to a separate assembler. Um, so that's kind of one small benefit um, is that everything is very tightly coupled there. Um, the LLVM linker is LVLLD. Um, and then we have LLVM versions of all of the binary utilities as well um, in the same manner. Um, and so uh, Clang is the C language front end for LLVM. And there are other language front ends that exist, such as Rust C. So the Rust compiler uh, by default uses LLVM as a backend. Um, again, showing the power that uh, you know, the same backend can be used for multiple different languages. Um, 
Clang is generally advertised as a drop-in uh, replacement for GCC. It's supposed to be compatible with GCC. Uh, in reality, this is kind of the case. Um, there are some flags that might not be implemented or may be implemented in different ways. Um, so the kernel handles this in a couple different ways. Um, I'll kind of go into that a little bit later. Um, and uh, one of the other huge benefits of, of Clang over GCC is that it's a multi-targeted binary by default. Um, so you change the target with the uh, dash dash target flag rather than using separate binaries that are targeting your particular architecture. Uh, so for example, uh, if I wanted to generate ARM64 code, I would just call Clang with the ARCH64 Linux GNU target um, versus uh, for GCC, I would have whole separate ARCH64 Linux GNU binaries for GCC, LLD, uh, or for LD, the assembler, all of those pieces. Uh, so the more architectures that you want to support, you have to have more binaries available with uh, the GNU tool chain, whereas with uh, Clang and LLVM, all of that is multi-targeted by default. Um, and then uh, kind of as I was talking about earlier with uh, Clang, it is a C language front end. So it takes in C or C++ and a couple of other uh, C derivatives like Objective-C. Uh, it generates uh, LLVM's intermediate representation. So you'll hear that referred to as LLVM IR. Um, and that IR is a uh, target and language independent uh, intermediate representation which as a result means that we get to go through and uh, mutate that intermediate representation uh, through a series of optimization passes uh, to kind of change the code in language independent ways. Um, for example, getting rid of uh, variable stores or uh, unused functions, things of that nature. Um, those are all uh, optimizations that can happen regardless of what language is being uh, is being used in the front end. Um, and then after all of the optimization passes that go and mutate that, uh, that intermediate representation, uh, we then hand it off to a target specific backend. So an ARM64 backend and uh, x86 backend, uh, all of these different computer architecture um, instruction sets. Uh, and the backend will then go and perform target specific optimizations and actually generate the machine code. Um, and then the LLVM linker is LD LLD. Um, uh, it's advertised as being compatible with the GNU linker in a similar manner as Clang. So again, trying to uh, be a drop in replacement whenever possible. Um, there are still some differences between the uh, linker implementations that we might have to work around or adapt to in the kernel. Um, but that's the, the nature of using different implementations of things. Um, it is multi-targeted like Clang as well. So same thing, um, you choose the target emulation that you would like to link with, um, and then it just goes and, and does, does that. Uh, one of the big benefits of LLD that you'll hear uh, advertised from various people um, is that it's generally faster at linking uh, than GNU LD, um, especially when debug information is involved. Um, so if you're looking for, you know, if speed is kind of one of your biggest concerns, um, LLD is a big uh, advantage there, especially if you're building larger kernel images uh, because uh, the uh, linker has to go through and actually link more code. If it's faster to do that, then you end up with an image quicker. Um, it uh, so those are kind of the the you know big pieces that people generally care about. You can actually use LLD uh, with GCC as well. Um, some people do that kind of for speed. Um, again, I'll go into that in uh, a little bit uh, as well. Um, so how do you actually get LLVM? Um, like how, how does one uh, acquire it and kind of start using it? So there's really three different uh, ways, at least for the kernel that we care about. Um, the first thing is your distributions package manager. Um, so I've included some commands here that will get you uh, the core of LLVM on um, some very popular distributions. So Arch, Debian, uh, slash Ubuntu, and Fedora. Um, the packages are all uh, named very similarly. Um, for Debian specifically, there is a uh, 
LLVM upstream maintains uh, up-to-date uh, distribution packages for Debian and Ubuntu. Um, that's the app.llvm.org link that is uh, that I've linked to right there. Um, that is outside of the official Debian and Ubuntu repositories, but uh, you can get much newer versions of uh, Clang and LLVM through that repository versus the uh, built-in one. Um, for Arch and Fedora, they tend to stay fairly up to date because they're um, both kind of rolling release-ish uh, distributions. Um, so for those, you don't usually have to worry about using a separate repository. The ones that are provided uh, in the latest versions of those repositories uh, will generally be good enough for working with the kernel. Um, I also maintain uh, tarballs on kernel.org um, that are specifically optimized for building the kernel. Um, because we can apply uh, certain uh, optimization technologies during the build of the compiler itself to make it faster at runtime. Um, I'll go to, into some of those a little bit later, uh, specifically for the kernel, but I can also touch on how those end up uh, making these tool chains a lot quicker. Um, and these are also really good if you're uh, just kind of looking to uh, get up and running relatively quickly because you can just extract them onto your hard drive somewhere uh, and then use them directly with a method that I'm going to talk about in just a little bit. Um, and those are much quicker than distribution versions because of those optimizations. Um, and then the other option is to uh, just build LLVM from source. Uh, just like building the kernel, you can build a compiler um, because at the end of the day, the compiler is just another piece of software. Um, I uh, maintain a, a set of toolchain build, strip, build scripts called TC build um, in uh, the Clang built Linux uh, GitHub repository um, that basically tries to take a lot of the manual configuration of LLVM um, and abstract it away into just uh, different flags that you may or may not care about. Um, so I, for example, I have a kind of quick start command here that basically builds a uh, distribution toolchain, which uh, in this case means just giving us the pieces that we care about for building a Linux kernel. Uh, LLVM has a lot of different utilities available to it. Um, and as a result, if you go and build those, you spend time building pieces that you may or may not be using for the kernel. That distribution target basically uh, makes it so that you're kind of only building what we really care about for the kernel itself. Um, and then the build stage one only flag is just building uh, only one stage of the compiler because you can actually build a compiler that goes and builds itself. And you'll uh, often hear that referred to as a two stage build. Um, but for kind of a quick start, we really only care about just having a compiler. We don't care about building it with itself and making sure that everything else is good. Um, and then uh, this just gives you the, the ref flag just gives you the latest uh, stable version of LLVM rather than the main uh, branch. LLVM tries to be incredibly stable um, and have the main branch be uh, in what they refer to as release always uh, mode or of release quality. Um, and so you'll see uh, if you do experience br breakage at uh, main, it is likely that it will be fixed relatively quickly uh, because LLVM has a lot of testing infrastructure to uh, ensure that uh, has a lot of testing infrastructure to ensure that the tree is always uh, in a release-worthy state so that people can just go and build it and start working on it um, at the tip of tree rather than at the thing. For the kernel, though, um, and for the sake of this presentation, um, if you were wanting to, to get up and running quickly, um, I would probably just use the latest stable version because we know that that works really well. Nathan, I have a quick yeah. question about um, your uh, a comment about kernel.org tarballs being mm -hmm. optimized and quicker than distribution versions. Do you mean that in what, what is in the context of quicker? What is that? Sure. Is... Yeah, I should definitely qualify that. So uh, this is purely about the amount of time that it takes to build a kernel. So from running, you know, make all or make image or whatever you're trying to build, uh, these tool chains are going to be quicker at building whatever target you want than like the distributions would be. This is not runtime performance. Like this is not 
uh, going to optimize your kernel better and make your kernel faster. It is going to make building your kernel faster um, and uh, be able to test it or run it faster uh, iterative, iteratively, for example. Does, yeah, that, uh, does that clarify yeah, yeah. things? Oh. That does clarify things. And uh, these are binaries, I think. Uh, Correct. Uh, okay, so. Okay. Yeah, Great. so those are, those are pre-built binaries. Um, and I've I've aimed to try to make them as compatible with uh, as many distributions as possible. Um, they are not statically linked, but the amount of dynamic de dependencies that they have um, should be easy to be fulfilled on uh, a majority of distributions, especially if they are uh, you know even a couple of years old. Right. So one thing I noticed is that integrated binary uh, for architectures is something that would be. So makes so much so many things so much easier because when I um have to build I have a tutorial that I did a while back on installing um different binaries for uh, different architectures to build with the GCC so you have to bring s several um binaries I mean install them to be able to build across the board using GCC so right. that is a that is so handy right that's uh one of the biggest things is. Uh, if you want to work across the tree and you want to work with multiple architectures, that uh, your the number of binaries and tools that you have to install to uh, to work with all those different targets uh, can be quite expansive. Um, and one of the like that's one of the the great things about this, especially now that we have uh, we depend on GNU bin utils uh, basically not at all, is that you can grab one of these tool chains from kernel.org, install it somewhere, and you have all the pieces to go and generate uh, generate kernels for all of the different architectures that uh, the tool chains support. Right, right. So I did I did just installed by the way Clang and LLVM on my Debian, um, and it just went very smoothly. And so it's uh, it's rather easy. All of these are supported on on the distros. Looks like I just followed along your presentation. Awesome. Yeah, and the the nice thing about the distribution uh, package manager, obviously, versus the other two, is that you will get automatic updates um, mm -hmm. to these uh, tools as you go on. So that's kind of, uh, I would say, the way that a lot of people prefer to work with these tools is to just install whatever their distribution has um, and start working uh, with them directly there. Thank you. Perfect. Oh, we do have a question if you want yeah. to fill that now. Um, Absolutely. Javier is asking um, if the LLVMs from the kernel.org tarballs are optimized for building kernel, would you re recommend to keep a second version example from the distro to build anything else beyond the kernel? It kind of depends on what you want to build. Um, so the kernel.org tarballs uh, kind of include the core of Clang and they include um, some pieces for building host programs, um, they can build a lot of C code. Um, like for example, I use those tool chains to build LLVM itself. Um, but your project may, like depending on what projects you need to build, um, you might need access to like the compiler runtime for the targets. The kernel.org tar tarballs don't have those. Um, the kernel.org tarballs um, currently do not have uh, any of like the static analyzer tools. Um, as we start to use or start to get those kind of more uh, and more useful um, and start to run those more, I would like to include uh, those tools in those tarballs. Um, but yes, if if you need to build a wide range of C and C++ uh, tools, then uh, then I would probably recommend like using your distribution versions for those and then using the kernel.org tarballs just for the kernel. Um, but again, they should, if you have those pieces kind of available through your distribution, then oftentimes the kernel.org tarballs can use those and, and basically find them in like the search path, for example. And also looks like what I picked up on is that if uh, people are playing with static analyzer options, then they probably want to use distribution. Is that correct? This, this is, yeah. Is that okay? For now. For now. For I now. think eventually I would potentially like to enable those um, in the kernel.org tool chains. Um, the kernel.org tool chains are focused on being kind of slim. They're focused on 
really including the stuff that is kind of only going to be relevant for the kernel uh, itself. Um, even some of like the self-tests, for example, may not build with the kernel.org tool chains if it doesn't include all the parts that they might need. Right. Um, and that's something that I would definitely like to improve. Um, I just kind of have to know maybe about those, those paper cuts. Um, so you can always file uh, on the kernel.org uh, tarballs page here. There's some information about reporting problems or uh, requesting things. Um, I'm always happy to uh, to look at uh, improving those and making them kind of more useful for people. Okay, so we have one more question. Yeah. Um, are these changes to Clang available as patches? We are building Yocto, so Clang is built from sources. It would be great to enable the same customizations there. Um, so there are no patches, uh, like the kernel.org tarballs and kind of the optimizations that I talked about, those are not in like patches or anything. Um, that is just purely in, in build commands, basically. Um, I can go into a little bit about this when we when we talk about some of kind of the optimization technologies about how you might apply those to like the tool chain itself, um, just to kind of get an idea for it. Um, but I'm always happy to kind of talk about um, that process uh, separately, or if you have any questions about uh, how those have been implemented, then I'm more than happy to uh, to do that. Great. I think one last question. Um, yeah. um, in this is in the chat. I will read out. Does the TC build scripts have the CMake commands for your optimized kernel dot or binaries? I would like to copy these from my own build scripts, I usually have a standard build of LLVM natively. Yeah, um, if you wanna see the commands that TC build, or uh, yeah, that TC build runs to uh, generate these tool chains, there is actually a show builds command flag um, that will show like the CMake invocation, uh, the Ninja invocation to do, uh, to do basically the same exact process uh, in, you know, whatever scripting or, uh, setup you already have available. Um, I've, I've tried to design TC build to be very modular um, and have uh, to be easy to kind of see how we put everything together, basically, because um, that's really the main point of the script. You can do everything that the script does manually, um, but it's going to be a lot tedious to kind of do it repetitively. Um, so that's kind of the, the purpose of the script. Um, and yeah, if you run it with the same uh, with the same commands that I use to generate the kernel.org tarballs, which I either have in the readme itself or uh, it's in like my personal scripts and I can kind of show uh, where those are to see what options it uses to generate those tool chains. Um, and then you can run it locally with like the show build commands option uh, and then kind of copy out of there basically whatever you need. Um, so I hope that hope that answers that question. Yeah, I think if if it doesn't, uh, please ask for a call of follow up question. Um, at this point, uh, we don't have any questions in the Q and A or chat. Nathan, you can continue. Awesome. I will go on then. Um, so for the kernel, um, we kind of have some supported versions and supported architectures. Uh, so for uh, Using LLVM to build the kernel, you have to have LLVM 13.0.1 or newer. Um, newer versions generally work better um, as we uh, have been very aggressive about trying to fix things in the tool chain that need to be fixed in the tool chain. Uh, so there are times where you know, a feature or something may not work in the kernel because we require a you know, newer tool chain that supports it or supports it properly. Uh, and so 13.0.1 is the minimum supported version, uh, but if you can get up to 18.19, um, I would def definitely recommend doing so. Um, and here are the list of supported architectures uh, that we support building in the kernel. This is not the list of, this is not the list of architectures that LLVM supports in general. There are some uh, targets that either don't have a kernel architecture at all, um, or where the kernel does not uh, have support for it yet. Um, so Spark is one of those examples. LLVM does have a Spark backend, but uh, as of this recording, at least, uh, there are no pieces in the kernel for actually building 
uh, Spark with Clang. Um, there is some work actually going into that currently, um, but it's not available. Uh, it's not available in any tree yet. Um, so we have the so we have ARM sixty four as well as thirty two bit ARM. Um, that architecture is pretty well supported. Um, it has seen a lot of testing, um, a lot of deployment. Um, Hexagon is a Qualcomm uh, digital signal processing uh, architecture. Um, it's actually the only architecture in the kernel that cannot be built with GCC. Um, it only has support in LLVM. So it's kind of an interesting uh, tidbit there. Um, we have Lunarch um, and MIPS. Um, those are, I would say, generally well supported. Um, maybe a few kind of rougher corner cases there. Um, you will often notice the older that an architecture is and the more code that it has that is kind of older, um, LLVM may or may not support it as well. Um, unfortunately, you know, LLVM is newer than GCC. And as a result, if there are any architectures that were well supported in GCC, but might have been uh, on the decline when LLVM was first introduced, those architectures probably aren't going to see uh, support. Motorola 68K is another grid one, has an LLVM backend not good enough or not mature enough to build uh, Linux kernel code. Um, PowerPC is another uh, is another one kind of similar. 64-bit uh, and 32-bit uh, are uh, supported. Same thing, you know, older architecture has a lot of history there. Depending on the corner cases and the configuration, may or may not work well, um, but we're always open to bug reports uh, on those. Uh, RISC V is obviously another up and coming uh, architecture, um, continues to see good support in uh, in both LLVM and GCC. Um, S390 is another one that uh, might be a little bit of a head scratcher um, since, you know, not super common to, for everybody to have a mainframe uh, available, but um, their, uh, their kernel team and LLVM team have been really good about uh, getting things supported in LLVM that the kernel needs. Um, and then, uh, making it so that the kernel takes advantage of uh, of whatever feature is available to it. Um, S390 was actually one of the last architectures to get uh, LLD uh, support. Um, and so now that that's working in Clang 18, um, we can just uh, build the full thing with LLVM. Uh, user mode Linux is another one uh, that's very common for testing with like KUnit, for example. Um, and lastly is uh, the classic x86 uh, and i386. So 64-bit and 32-bit x86, uh, another one of those things that is uh, very well supported. Um, the 32-bit side is, is uh, maybe not as well supported as the 64-bit in certain areas, um, but for the most part, everything uh, should work very well. So both the UM um, uh, user mode and uh, XG6, I, I know I, I expect that to be supported well. Uh, user mode, did you say, is supported well as well? Yes, yeah, okay. it is supported well as well. Um, again, one of those things where corner cases and configurations and stuff like that may always, uh, you know, cause certain issues, uh, but for the most part, should work well. We're testing it in continuous integration, um, so uh, if people want to use that for, you know, testing K unit and stuff like that, I would expect it to work well. Yeah, that is my workflow when I um, test uh, stuff for uh, my pull requests. So that's why I'm asking both UM and x86. That's what I use to verify that KUnit stuff is good. So yep. good to know. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Um, so uh, the official kernel documentation, I have a link here. Um, it just lives in uh, the KBuild directory. Um, so KBuild has several variables uh, that you can set or change uh, for various tools that are invoked during the kernel build. So similar to how I uh, kind of have that table there earlier, we have the CC variable for the C compiler. Uh, we have the LD variable for the linker. Uh, we have various variables for the bin utils. Um, and then we also have separate uh, variables uh, for building host programs. So there are times in the kernel where we need to uh, build a build a program that is going to run on the host and do something for us during the kernel build, we have tools um, and variables to uh, build those with LLVM as well. Um, so this is a the first command here. The first make command is basically what you would set if you wanted to use all of these different variables to set the LLVM equivalents. Um, 
you're going to notice that it's pretty long. It would be really annoying if we, uh, <laughs> it would be really annoying if we had to type this every single time that we uh, wanted to build this. Um, so we actually introduced uh, just the LLVM make variable to uh, automatically be able to set those. So if you wanted to have an equivalent to the above command, you would just run make LLVM equals one. Uh, the actual equals one value has no meaning. Uh, it is only whether or not it, the variable is set. So if I had said make LOVM equals zero, it would have been the same thing as make LOVM equals one. If you don't want to use LOVM with a particular build or you don't want to use a component of LOVM for a particular uh, build, let's say, for example, I didn't want to use the LOVM AR, um, then I would say make LOVM equals one, and then I could put AR equals AR or something like that after it um, to basically override what I set uh, with LLVM equals one. Um, there are two different, uh, there are two other significant uh, values that you can have for LLVM, uh, which make it easy to work with non-standard tool chains. So with LLVM equals one, for example, it's setting all of these values by default. So it's setting LLVM AR, Clang, LOD, all of that. Uh, but for example, if you installed uh, your compiler from app.lovm.org, uh, you're going to end up with suffixed binaries. Um, so for example, if I install like clang19, for example, it's going to install it as clang-19 rather than like clang, for example. Uh, and as a result, we have added the ability to uh, use the value of the LOVM variable to suffix onto all of the binaries. So if you have LOVM uh, equals dash 19, it's going to uh, and dash 19 to all of the previous uh, values uh, for, excuse me, all of these commands. Um, so like I said, that's useful for working with app.lovm.org packages. The other uh, value that we have, uh, or the other option that we have for the LLVM variable is to uh, set, uh, to prepend a path to the values. So, you know, you would say LOVM equals the full path to uh, your bin folder um, that contains all of your uh, binaries, and then you're going to have it uh, have a trailing slash after that. And as a result, whatever you uh, define as the LOVM value will automatically get prepended to all of the other default values. Um, this is uh, really useful for, for example, the kernel.org tool chains that I mentioned before, um, where they might be installed on disk, but maybe you don't want to use them globally for all of your projects. Maybe you only want to use that tool chain to build the kernel, um, at which point you can use this LOVM value um, to set it to that prefix. Um, and that way you're getting, uh, you're using the full path to the binary uh, rather than calling it through path. Um, and absolute paths are helpful for verifying that you're actually using the correct tool chain. Um, because if you add a folder to path, but maybe let's say that you screwed up the, uh, the variable value. Let's say that you added like just the prefix rather than like the bin folder to your, uh, to your path, but you have Clang installed in your path somewhere else, if you were to go and try to use the tool chain that you added to your path, it's going to fall back to the uh, it's going to fall back to to a different uh, version of Clang than maybe you intended, uh, and that can uh, cause problems in weird ways um, that I might mention uh, coming up. Uh, the main one is just that your cake and big values might not be set. Um, uh, perfect. Um, so you can change targets. Uh, sorry. Oh, Nathan, uh, just yeah. a quick question. So mm -hmm. uh, when I say say LLVM equal to one, it's such mm -hmm. a cryptic um, option, even though right. it does a great op, uh, great way, automates everything. Uh, mm -hmm. Does it dump, um, the print the command it's going to actually run when, when, uh, when uh, any of these things are run? Like for example, if I just ran LLVM equal to one, will it show me what it's doing? So it doesn't show it to you by default, but you can mm -hmm. verify that it's being used if you use the v equals one make variable. So you can okay. set v equals one in addition to LOVM equals one. 
and your your build will be a lot noisier because you're going to see the full command that's being used to build every single translation unit. Right. But you can make sure that like the first command that you have in, uh, like you can make sure that for every like C file that Clang's actually being used, for example. So it's a little, it's kind of a little opaque, um, but. Yeah, it would be nice to just print the command if, if you are making some improvements to it. That would be awesome. There are, So. yeah, I, I think I might have an idea for how to do that. Um, Okay. so I'll think, I'll think about it. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. So the, uh, so if you want to, so the nice property about, uh, having like an LLVM equals one variable and having a multi-targeted tool chain uh, is that you don't have to set a separate cross-compile variable. So with GCC, you set cross-compile to, you know, ARCH64 Linux GNU dash, and then that gets prepended to GCC, LD, AS, all of, uh, all of those uh, tools. Uh, but for LLVM, because we just have the target flag Uh, you only need to change the arch variable to change what uh, target uh, is being used here. So if I say make LLVM equals one, I'm just building a kernel for whatever architecture my host machine is, is using. Um, but if I set make AR, or arch equals ARM64, LLVM equals one, uh, I now get a kernel or I'm targeting uh, ARCH64. Um, Cross compile is pretty much never used uh, with LLVM. Uh, Except for, uh, except for the case when uh, we're using GNU AS and we're using Clang, um, which is very uh, kind of more of a power user uh, thing at this point, truthfully. Um, PowerPC is, a, is an exception to this rule right now because they have a boot wrapper that wraps the entire uh, kernel image and that uh, script Uh, uses cross compile as kind of a hard coded thing. So it uses GNU bin utils uh, rather than the LLVM ones. Uh, and there are kind of a few corner cases that we need to account for that I unfortunately just haven't gotten, <laughs> gotten around to actually supporting, unfortunately. Um, and then uh, the last kind of thing that I always mention to people is make sure that you're setting LLVM equals, whatever LLVM value you have set. Uh, make sure that it is consistently set for every make invocation that you do. Um, because uh, kconfig several years ago gained support for testing and enabling certain features based on whether or not the toolchain actually supports it or if the toolchain is at a version that supports it. Um, this is really important if you're ever doing non-interactive configuration changes. So if you're using like the config script in scripts uh, or like running said uh, on the config file directly. Um, to change various values, you want to make sure that it when you go to actually update the configuration that you have the correct value set so that that can get updated. Um, I okay, and then I have a couple examples here of, of how you Sorry. would actually, yeah. Sorry, Neil. I have a we have a question here in the Sure. chat in the Q and A. Why doesn't the kernel use LLVM config for managing prefix and other paths rather than using prefix slash bin? Is it something that is interesting to the community? Um, I'm not actually sure. I haven't really looked into LLVM config and seeing uh seeing how that would potentially be used. Um. I think the the primary reason that we don't use like LLVM config or any sort of uh, automated management of that um, per se is uh, because we want to give people the ability to to customize this and set this kind of as you need to. Um, I use I use LLVM equals one and I use the LLVM equals with the trailing slash pretty consistently because, for example, if I have to go bisect a problem in LLVM, I Uh, want to be able to make sure that I'm actually testing the compiler that I just built, uh, you know, rather than having to kind of fudge with path and maybe, you know, mixing that up and having an incorrect bisect result. Uh, the the real benefit of like having, L of, having a full path to your compiler is that if you get it wrong, it errors because it can't find the compiler rather than maybe falling back to path um, and using a compiler that maybe you didn't intend to actually use.
Uh, that's, a, that's a good point. Yes. Uh, because you don't want to use something that you didn't in, intend to use and uh, the, the results are hard to debug or interpret. Right. It's, it's very, it's very unfortunate when you use the wrong compiler because you maybe aren't failing your test when you thought you should, or uh, you might be uh, not testing a feature that you thought you were testing. Uh, there are kind of a lot of ways to uh, to potentially mess that up and figuring out that that's what happened is, is often pretty difficult um, unless you're looking for it. Right. Thank you. That, that's all we have in the question. Perfect. Um, so I kind of have an example here of maybe the workflow that you might use if you were building an uh, entry configuration target. So I just picked kind of a simple, easy uh, ARM64 ARM virtual machine configuration target. So just vert config. Um, so we've set the ARM64 variable um, or set the arch variable to ARM64, and then we've set LLVM equals one. And then we've run vert config, which is a configuration target. So the so kconfig is going to go through and set a bunch of options um, based on whether or not our tool chain supports them. Um, and then after that, uh, we can go ahead and build the kernel image and the modules, ensuring again that we're using the same values values and make variables that we used previously. Um, if you don't include any make target, if you just leave it blank, it's the same thing as using the default, which in the kernel's case is just all. Um, and as a result, you can actually combine uh, both of these separate commands into one command. Um, so that you do the configuration and the building at the same time. This is another way basically to avoid kind of the pitfall of not setting the same variables across your build commands by just running everything as one command in general. Um, and then the other example that people might use is uh, like building a distribution kernel, for example. Very similar thing, um, you're gonna grab, uh, rather than you know generating a uh, configuration target like we did previously. We might want to grab the current running config from um, conf uh, uh, config.gz. Um, your configuration could be in boot. Um, I know that Debian and Fedora both include the uh, running configurations in uh, in the boot folder. Um, and so you can just copy those to .config. Um, when you do that, the configuration may have been built with a tool chain that is not the same one that you're using. So even if it's a different, LO, like even if your distribution does use LLVM, it might not be the same version of LLVM that you're about to build with. Um, so if you want to be prompted for uh, new options available to you because you've switched tool chains, uh, then you don't want to run this next step. Um, but if you don't want to be prompted for new options. If you just want to use whatever the default was going to be, if it was going to be on, it'll be on. If it's going to be off, if it was going to be off, it'll be off um, with the old def config target. Um, again, same thing, making sure that whatever variable uh, or whatever variables we set during the configuration stage are also the same one that we use to build the kernel. Um, and then kbuild has uh, the ability to actually generate distribution packages directly uh, from the kernel tree itself. Um, and that also works with LLVM equals one. So um, there's Pacman package, there's um, bin RPM package, which will build a binary RPM package, um, and then bin dev package, which will build a binary Debian package. So these uh, packages are really useful for uh, installing and testing your kernels um, while not potentially like blowing away your, uh, well, not blowing away your current running uh, kernel, for example, um, if you were to do like, make modules install or something of that nature. Um, are there any questions so far? Have I have I left anybody behind? Is there anything that uh, people want some clarification on? If no there are, questions then, uh... in, yeah, no questions in the chat or Q and A, and please do ask. This might is this a good stopping? I mean, question taking point for you, Nathan. Uh, yeah, I think I'm oh. I'm about to I think move on to some other stuff. If there's okay. any anything that uh, anybody's had questions on up to this point, um, I definitely welcome those. Not seeing any activity. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> um. So why would we even want to do this? Like, why would you even want to build uh the kernel with LLVM? We have GNU. Uh, Perfect working implementation. Why would we even want to do this? 
Um, so the, the real kind of benefit of uh, having a whole separate tool chain implementation is that we ultimately get a different uh, set and implementation of warnings and features. Um, because they're not the same, we potentially have the, the freedom and the ability to kind of implement our own warnings, change warnings that uh, GCC might have implemented, but maybe we want to enhance them further. For example, uh, with GCC, the unused but set variable, where if you have you know, A equals zero, for example, and then nowhere in the function do we actually use A um, or use the value of A, um, then we'll get a, a warning that says, hey, you set this variable, but you haven't actually done anything with it. One of the differences between GCC and Clang's implementation of that warning is that GCC or is that Clang will warn if, for example, we've uh, used a unary operator, like a post increment or a pre increment. Um, so like if I have A++ in there somewhere, GCC won't actually warn about that, even though we might not have actually used the value of A that we're incrementing at any point in the function, whereas Clang will, for example. Um, so same warning, different implementation, different code that it maybe warns on. Um, or, you know, entire warnings that do not exist in either or in one or other of the compilers. This is not a, a problem that is specific to Clang. It's also one that GCC has. You know, GCC may not implement all the warnings that Clang does, just as Clang may not implement all the warnings that GCC does. Um, it's the same thing with features. So uh, both compilers uh, have uh, optimizations such as link time optimization and profile guided optimization, but maybe due to how they're implemented and how they work, we may or may not be able to take advantage of them in the kernel. Um, we also have sanitizers. Um, LLVM is is a uh, is often where sanitizers are initially implemented, and then uh, they're ported over to GCC because LLVM's uh, optimization and, and pass infrastructure is, um, I would say, a lot easier maybe to work with and kind of add these these sanitizers. So we have like the memory sanitizer or like the kernel control flow integrity sanitizer. Um, that will go through and, you know, automatically instrument code and try to find problems for you. Um, and then security features are becoming uh, ever more common in the, in the tool chains um, because they can go through and, uh, you know, automatically insert different, uh, can automatically insert things or change things uh, across an entire code base where it might be infeasible to do those manually. Um, so like structure layout randomization, for example, there are certain structures that might be security sensitive uh, and we might want to randomize the order of members in there so that like an attacker can never know that, hey, this very or this member has this offset into this structure. Um, another one is that I'll talk about a little bit um, is uh, automatic stack variable initialization. So like initializing, always initializing a variable. Um, and yeah. You'll see uh, a lot of the security features, especially nowadays, um, are being implemented in both compilers, you know, simultaneously or as as simultaneously as possible, uh, because we really want to leverage the tool chain and leverage the compiler to fix code for us or avoid problems as much as possible. Um, and so we're, we're having a lot more of those um, crop up and uh, be useful, basically. Um, another thing is like the the big benefit of having these two large projects is that we get to actually turn them against each other um, and result in more code or better supported features. Um, I mean, the kernel is one of the largest and the most expansive C code bases in the world. Um, it's a great stressor for uh, Clank C support and making sure that, that these things work well um, across a variety of different projects. Like the, the kernel uses C in ways that the majority of projects will never do. Um, and so it's it's important basically to have uh, to have that as kind of a tester and a stressor for uh, that C support. Um, Asm go to is another great uh, feature that the kernel takes advantage of in a lot of different places. Um, and it was actually implemented in LLVM specifically because the Linux kernel required it. Um, and being kind of at that table allows us to say, hey, you know, the kernel cares a lot about X, Y, and Z thing. We're a big project um, and, and being at the table and getting our voice in uh, is important for kind of the direction of that project. Um, and then the last thing is just that uh, we fixed, fixed numerous issues in uh, both the kernel and even sometimes the compiler 
um, due to uh, differences between the compiler implementations, uh, maybe such, such as like optimization differences around the presence of undefined behavior. Um, like there was one case uh, that I've linked to here where the kernel is attempting to cast away const um, so that something that was declared as const can be modified later, which defeats the purpose of const. And there was a change in LLVM that actually started removing stores to constant memory and ended up breaking uh, boot in one of the process in the breaking boot in the process. Now this didn't happen in a lot of places, but there's a very clear uh, like there was a very clear problem or a very clear result from the kernel getting into trouble with undefined behavior. So Nathan, would you say, I think what I'm hearing is that um, building, if you are writing a driver from scratch, or if you are wanting to find out um, all the places, security related um, things that could be lurking and any other kinds of uninitialized variables and those kinds of things, it would be good to build with uh, GCC and Clang for better coverage. That's kind of what I'm Correct. hearing, I think. Correct. So do you see any um, things that uh, contradict each other? Like for example, GCC might warn something well, I mean, you pointed out one thing that GCC doesn't want, like, for, ex for example, A++ plus or posting. Mm -hmm. um, but is there anything that they conflict in terms of how it needs to be fixed? Um, for Generally, no. I, I mean, at this point, I'm hoping that a lot of the warnings uh, that we get are basically the same between the compilers. Like, I'm, I'm hoping that the you know, that if you, if there's a problem that both compilers catch it, right? Okay. That's kind of the, that's the goal, you know, is that we want both compilers to be able to warn about the same code because it means that they both agree that, hey, there's a potential problem here. But there are times where, you know, like I mentioned, because of the implementation of the warnings, you know, GCC or Clang may have chosen like, hey, we know that the other compiler does or doesn't warn about this code, but maybe we do, or maybe we don't. Like maybe, you know, we decide that, hey, this is something that we really want to, uh, like this is something that we really want to warn about because we think that there could be a lot of problems. Whereas GCC might be like, eh, we don't care as much about uh, maybe the some of the false negatives that we're going to get. Um, so, you know, we don't, or we care more maybe about the false positives that we're going to get from changing this very or like changing this warning in this way so we're not going to do it or maybe we're going to put it under like a different warning or something of that nature um but i have very rarely seen the case where like uh like i think maybe what you're talking about is where like clang warns about something that gcc doesn't warn about and we go and implement a fix for the warning in or like we go and implement a war a fix uh for the clang warning but then maybe like gcc complaints or something of that right nature. That's those are very few and far between at this point, I would say. Okay. Um, and that's kind of the other thing too, is we, we want to avoid doing that. We want to avoid breaking GCC in pursuit of supporting Clang, because what's the point at that point, right? Like we want to make sure that both compilers get along and that any fixes that we've done don't break use of the other tool chain. Right. You're not competing. It's more like mm -hmm. you are you are saying we are better off with the two tools, the strong tools that would help us um, get to where we are in terms of making it more secure, more bug free and so on. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Um, and yeah, warnings are kind of one of those those big things. Um, so, you know, warnings point out potential problems in the code, um, but they have heuristics. They have things that uh, you know, cases that they've exempted, they have uh, things that they're looking for, and those may or may not always be correct. Um, it's always important that when you get a warning or you see a warning, that you're thinking about exactly what the warning is pointing out, and you're also looking at the context of the code around it, not just focusing on silencing it. Um, it is really important, you know, that you, you think that warnings are trying to point out a problem to you. They're trying to point out that, hey, you're doing something here that may or may not be correct. 
Now, it, it may be correct, in which case you can go about silencing it, but it's it's often easier to kind of take a step back, you know, look maybe at the code all around it um, and see, is this something that's actually a problem? Um, when in doubt, you should just ask the code author or the maintainer that, that wrote the code that introduced that because oftentimes your, uh, because oftentimes your, not going to necessarily have the same understanding or be able to understand the author's intent, which is often where uh, warnings stem from. Is like, hey, what did the author intend to do here? Not necessarily what did the author do. Um, another big, like uh, one of the differences between uh, Clang and GCC warnings uh, is that the mass, vast majority of Clang's warnings happen in the front end uh, and if they happen in the front end, they might not have information uh, that is available to them if they were to uh, run after optimizations. Like for example, if you, uh, maybe you have a function that gets inlined into another function, and then at that point, a warning from the function that got inlined may go away because it has more information kind of across those function boundaries. Uh, you know, Clang would end up warning in the situation where the, the function didn't get inlined because inlining hasn't happened at that point yet. Whereas GCC implements a lot of their warnings in the middle end, uh, which can be influenced in the uh, uh, in the middle end, basically. And that can be, in, they can influence, uh, be influenced by the outcome of optimizations, which is sometimes good because you can catch more problems, uh, but it can potentially introduce false positives uh, or show you a false positive uh, because it has run after these optimizations maybe have transformed the code in a way that you didn't actually do. So it, it's uh, it's sort of like a pick your poison kind, kind of deal. Do you want to potentially miss problems or do you want to worry about problems that are getting flagged to you that may or may not be problems? There's not really a right answer, unfortunately. There are some times where uh, there are some times where we have to turn off a warning in the kernel uh, for GCC because of this problem, uh, and then maybe we get some coverage from it from Clang, or not at all. One common one is like the array bounds warning, for example. For GCC right now, it's disabled because it runs into a bunch of problems with uh, optimization uh, changes. And Clang does have it enabled, but Clang also catches a lot fewer problems with it because it can only look, for example, at like a scalar, uh, it can only look at like a scalar uh, variable value. So like, for example, if I had A brackets like four, but I have A declared with brackets three, for example, um, it would catch you trying to access that array out of bounds. Uh, whereas if it were just like a, uh, like a variable that was being used to access that, Clang definitely is not going to warn in that situation, but GCC might if it can track the value of the variable through inlining, for example. So I'm gonna kind of go over a couple of uh, warnings that I think are uh, interesting for the kernel um, and also uh, show up uh, maybe relatively frequently. WN initialized is a very common one, um, and it'll bear, basically warn when you're using a variable uninitialized. So, for example, you have, uh, you know, you have this variable x. I'm passing its value into foo, but I haven't actually initialized it. Um, a lot of these examples are going to be extremely contrived. You would obviously never write code that actually has this problem, but it's more just to kind of illustrate what the warning text is going to give you um, and then how you might go about fixing it, for example. So the nice thing about claim warnings is that they'll point out, hey, this variable is being used is being used uninitialized, right? Uh, but then it does also have a note here that says, if you uh, want to fix this problem with a code fix, maybe just initialize the variable to zero. This uh, hint or uh, you'll call, hear it called a fix it um, is, is really helpful, obviously. There are times where it might not be totally useful. For example, if I had, uh, maybe for example here, if I had uh, X as a pointer and I and I didn't use it or, or I used it uninitialized, it might tell me to initialize this to null. In some cases that might be okay, but if I were going to uh, dereference that you know, pointer maybe in the function, for example, maybe I don't wanna pass in null because then I'm gonna just get a crash. 
Um, but again, this is kind of one of those key things to remember is think about what the what the message is trying to tell you here. It's telling you that your variable is uninitialized. It offers a potential hint or a fix it to resolve it, but that hint or that fix it is often going to be mechanical or not necessarily know the intent of your code around it. So it is merely a suggestion. You should look and see, did I intend to use this variable uninitialized or should it be initialized to a different value? Should I just not use it at all? You know, things of, of that nature. Um, it's just gonna all depend on the particular context of the code uh, that it's warning about. Um, there's another uh, version of this warning, which is sometimes uninitialized. Um, and just as the name implied, uh, it means that it is not used uh, uninitialized unconditionally, it may only be used uninitialized in certain cases or may be uninitialized in certain cases. So for example, if we have the same exact kind of foo bar, uh, you know, convention that we had before, but maybe we, uh, maybe we do initialize X, but we only initialize it in this if uh, statement. So again, helpfully, Clang is going to point out that, hey, if you take this, uh, if you do not take this if condition, uh, then you are going to use X uninitialized. Um, and this one actually offers us uh, a couple more helpful hints. So it does say, hey, you still can initialize this uh, to zero, but it may be the case, for example, that like, you know, in this case, maybe I know that any val that I pass in here is going to be greater than zero. In which case, I might just want to initialize this variable to one unconditionally and just remove the if statement altogether. Um, or if I'm like, no, I, I may pass in a negative value, uh, but I need to make sure that X is the correct value. I either could add an else uh, statement here, or I could just initialize the variable um, at the top like it says. Um, same thing. This is very, very, it is very common to hit this problem in the kernel, um, often because of uh, error codes. So like if I had, for example, if, you know, this value is greater than zero, I might want to like return e val or something. Like I might want to say you gave me an invalid value, um, but maybe I want to do like some cleanup or some other uh, thing in that function before I return that value. Um, I might have go to and then another label, do whatever cleanup I need to have and then return ret um, underneath that. Um, and it is very common uh, for people to forget to set an error code in those uh, if statements. Um, in which case you might be returning just uninitialized memory. Um, and yeah, so this is very common, uh, mainly because GCC's version of this warning is disabled under normal conditions. Um, this is this kind of goes back to, to what Shu and I were talking about a little bit ago is the benefit of having side-by-side -side builds. You know, if, if you want to continue to use GCC to, you know, produce your kernel under normal conditions, that's totally fine but it also might be beneficial for you to just do a build with Clang so that you can potentially uh, potentially find these sort of issues uh, aside from runtime. Um, and uh, I, I have this uh, example here of, you know, something where it's very innocuous to, or very easy to hit this problem. So we got a, uh, a warning on this code that said op code was being, uh, was only initialized uh, in certain cases. And, you know, we, I look at it and I'm like, okay, that's odd. We have the if statement here, dialects being assigned in the if statement, and then op code is being assigned outside of the if statement. Why do we have a warning? until I noticed very subtly that there was a comma at the end of the dialect assignment instead of a semicolon, which completely changes the meaning of this code because it means that op code getting set to null will only happen in the if statement. It's basically as if I had moved op code equals null right next to the comma there. Um, and so that was a really funny, uh, that was a really funny warning because you know on the surface, it doesn't look like there should even be a warning here until you realize that, hey, this comma actually completely changes the meaning of this code. Um, so we just replaced it with a semicolon and moved on. Um, and the the kind of thing with uninitialized, uh, you know, the thing with uninitialized variables is this is potentially a security problem, right? We're potentially displaying a uh, previous stack value or stack, uh, uninitialized stack memory. Um, so it could be anything. Uh, and I'll kind of go into a little bit 
uh, more about the security implications about that a little bit later um, when I go over one of the features that I mentioned previously. Um, another uh, warning that I actually think is really interesting um, is the W header guard uh, warning. So it's very common in the kernel for header uh, files to kind of have an if uh, if not defined uh, guard value, define the guard value, and then put all of the header information in there. Uh, and that ensures that you cannot, or that you can include uh, headers only once. Um, otherwise, if you include them multiple times through different header include paths, you may end up with a you know, duplicate declaration uh, error. Um, but in the case here, we actually got the header guard wrong. Like we, we misspelled it and we have an extra O in there. So this code actually isn't gonna work as we have intended for it to. Um, and Clang will actually point that out and say, it's, hey, you wrote this as if you wanted a header guard, but you misspelled it. So what did you mean to do here? Um, not something that you would necessarily, that's uh, going to show problems on the surface immediately, right? might only show up after you have made this change uh, when somebody else maybe includes that header uh, in a translation unit that transitively had it included prior, right? Um, so this is a really good warning. Um, GCC actually, I think, implemented this in for GCC 15, if I understand correctly. So this is one that's uh, actually going to uh, have an implementation in both compilers. So, you know, we'll get it for, for both, which is good. This is another uh, one that I have found uh, crops up from time to time and it's a little bit unexpected. So you might have some uh, some code here that is, uh, you know, maybe I wanna get some flag values, but maybe I want to enable or disable a flag uh, based on a Boolean value maybe. Um, so I, you know, I know that flag one is always gonna be enabled here, but based on the value of uh, val, I'm gonna add flag two to that bit mask. Well, this code actually isn't going to do what you think it's going to do um, because the uh, ternary operator actually has a lower precedent than the uh, bitwise uh, operator. This code's actually always going to return flag two because flag one uh, bitwise or, or with val uh, is always going to be one, in which case we're going to return flag two rather than oring together flag one and flag two. Um, so in this case, you know, it's pretty obvious what the author intended, right? You know, we'll add parentheses around the entire ternary condition, uh, which is the second, uh, you know, which is the second suggestion uh, in this thing. Uh, this has come up a couple times um, in the kernel. And it would be very surprising, right, to try to debug this because, you know, you would you would be expecting that the that you're going to get these two flag values out if, you know, Boolean is is true, but you're not. You will always get. Uh, you will always get flag two out of this condition because the uh, the value of val does not influence uh, the way that this code is written. Um, this is another one that is uh, that is very interesting. Um, so if you uh, so in this case we have two functions. You know we're comparing the value of the functions. Uh, against some values, and we're uh, you know trying to make sure that both of those functions return greater than a particular value, right? Um, the problem is is that the way that I've written this code is not going to result in any logic problems because you know the bitwise or is still going to to and together the uh, the results and give me the correct logical. Uh, uh, value, but the bitwise uh, or does not uh, short circuit like the logical or does. So for example, I maybe don't want to call func2 here uh, if the first condition is false. So let's say, you know, func1 is not greater than two, maybe I don't want to call func2 at that point. But with bitwise or, or bitwise and, uh, both of these conditions are going to get evaluated. Um, whereas if I add a logical and, if the first condition is false, we won't even run the second. Um, so this is, again, contrived example, but there is code in the kernel where it has, uh, where it is wanting to run multiple functions and then oring the results together. 
Um, but there are also cases in the kernel where, you know, if you, uh, like, for example, if, you know, I'm testing for a uh, null, like if I'm testing for a pointer being null, then I may not want to then call or dereference the pointer uh, after the check, basically. So if I mess that up, this warning uh, tries to fix it. Um, the other one that uh, comes up that GCC has some support for, but not uh, to the same extent that that Clang does, is uh, the tautological compare warning. Um, this is actually a collection of warnings. You can see this with the uh, Diag tool uh, output that may uh, come with your Clang distribution package. Um, and you can see that this warning actually has a bunch of different sub warnings. Clang does this so that uh, developers have the ability to kind of customize which uh, exact warnings they may or may not want. Because um, you might want, you know, maybe you want the majority of these, but maybe you don't want the, you know, negation compare or something of that nature. Um, and these warnings are uh, trying to point out uh, conditions that are either always true or always false um, because of some sort of logic problem. So like, for example, in this code, uh, I have a, uh, I have an integer and I'm wanting to check that it is, uh, both less than one and greater than two. Well, that condition can never be true. Uh, it's always false. Uh, this should have obviously been a logical or operator. I'm wanting to check if A is either less than one or greater than two. So it's letting you know, hey, you screwed this up um, because you have a condition here that cannot be satisfied. Um, it's the same thing uh, with the tautological constant out of range compare warning. Some of these warnings are not exactly the shortest to say, but uh, still give you good results. For example, if I'm passing in an unsigned character um, and I'm checking that it's greater than 256, uh, which is always false because by definition, uh, an unsigned uh, character is either between zero or 255. So another way to kind of catch uh, various problems that have that can show up um, from that. Um, I think that's it that I have for warnings right now. Does anybody have any questions about anything that I've covered there? There is one just comment from Javier in the uh, chat. It's worth uh, highlighting, I think. Um, Javier says, um, another example I have experienced with regards to differences between GCC and Clang, a go-to before declaring a variable with the cleanup attribute, Clang throws an error um, and not just a warning. GCC is happy with it. That's yep. the observation. Yep, that is a very common thing that has come up um, in the past couple of months as the cleanup attribute is starting to see more use in the kernel. Um, yes, absolutely. If you declare a variable with the cleanup attribute um, and before that declaration, you have like a go-to or uh, basically anything other than a return, uh, you will potentially run into a crash. Um, and this is something absolutely that Clang uh, flags does not even allow to compile, uh, whereas GCC does, and it actually results in, in potential logic problems at runtime. Um, because you're passing in an uninitialized uh, value to the cleanup function. And, you know, at that point, all bets are off. Um, so yeah, that's definitely a very, a very, uh, you know, big thing that like, another one of those kind of differences, you know, it's it's subtle, but, you know, there are times where, where one compiler is like, hey, I really care about, you know, care about not getting this wrong and letting somebody know that they've done something wrong versus, you know, another, uh, you know, might not be as high a priority, so. Yeah, th thanks for uh, pointing that out. It's definitely a, uh, a good thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Javier. All right, cool. I'm going to move on to uh, just a couple of features uh, that we have supported in the kernel then. Um, so the first one is uh, link time optimization. So this is an optimization technique where uh, Clang compiles C code to LLVM bit code instead of uh, machine code. Uh, and that allows the linker to go ahead and perform um, additional optimizations on the entire program um, rather than just translation units themselves. Um, and these include things like inlining across translation units, um, which can uh, 
allow additional optimizations uh, and performance, uh, but uh, can cost you in terms of code size. So that's kind of one of the things with LTO is it's some people use it because they want to see their, their code size shrink because maybe more, more things can be eliminated through like dead code elimination, um, but they might not... Uh, uh, but uh, that's not always the case because the compiler might do certain transformations or something that improve performance because it has access to the entire program, but it might not be uh, better in terms of code size, like it's making that sort of trade-off. Um, we have two different modes that we have in the kernel. Um, there's two different kconfig options. So the first is config LTO claim full. So this is what we call full LTO. Um, and it has more optimization potential just because of how it's structured, um, but it's slower to link because it is single threaded. Um, and this uh, is especially noticeable as the kernel image size increases. So the bigger your kernel, the more time the full LTO is going to take. Um, we also have an option called thin LTO. So you have config LTO claim thin, um, which is faster because it is uh, multi-threaded and it can do um, a lot of transformations in parallel. Um, and it gets most of the optimization uh, of full LTO because of that, but there are some times where it, it doesn't maybe perform quite as well. Um, it's, you know, again, that's kind of a, a trade-off there. Um, and then uh, we have uh, support for kernel, kernel control flow integrity. Um, so you can call functions through uh, indirectly through pointers, um, but this is this can be dangerous because if you have a, a, an attacker who is able to get control of one of those pointers, uh, they might be able to arbitrarily call a function, basically. Um, and what control flow integrity tries to do is restrict the number of functions that a particular indirect call can actually target. And the way that it does that is by checking that the prototype of the function that you're calling matches the expected prototype of the indirect call um, at runtime. Um, there are some warnings that we have um, that are not on quite yet to uh, try to highlight some of these issues at compile time um, and make it more obvious that, hey, we expect these prototypes to match exactly, not, for example, in like an ABI compatible way. So for example, like if you had a function that was returning an integer, but maybe you uh, were assigning it uh, to, or you were assigning you know, that pointer um, from a function that returns like an enum, for example. Uh, GCC and Clang by default will not warn about this because you know, int and enum are ABI compatible. That doesn't uh, affect anything from a, a calling convention perspective, but it does impact, uh, but it, it isn't correct or it could be made more restrictive um, by making the uh, the prototypes match. So for example, you know, the calling function might need to return an int, or maybe the prototype should actually be updated to return an enum instead. You know, it's just kind of one of those things that depends contextually on the code. Um, you can see a uh, example of kind of the code that it's, uh, that it's trying to flag in the um, LKDTM test, uh, which is the Linux, Linux kernel dump test module. Um, so it's basically uh, trying to find problems uh, or point out problems and, and have something to test. Um, and you can enable this in uh, kconfig with uh, CFI claim. Um, and here's a kind of example of what a uh, CFI failure looks like. Um, if anybody ever has any questions about that, I'm always happy to, uh, to you know, help analyze CFI failures. Um, they can definitely be tricky to uh, to hunt down and, and figure out exactly what's going on, depending on the level of indirection that there is. Um, all right, and I think last uh, feature that I have up um, is the automatic stack variable initialization that I mentioned earlier. So um, it's really easy to use variables uninitialized in C, um, and this is always a logic problem. It is always a bug to use a variable uninitialized. Um, but sometimes, like I mentioned, it can have security implement security implications as well, um, because you may reveal stack contents, um, you know, from previous functions um, or things of that nature. Um, 
So there is a uh, compiler flag for F trivial, it's F trivial auto var in it um, to automatically initialize uh, stack variable contents deterministically. So there's two options that you can set. There is uh, there's the zero option, which just initializes all variables to zero. Um, and then there's the pattern initialization, um, which initializes all variables to an obvious and repeated pattern. This is supposed to be helpful for debugging. So for example, I think Clang's uh, current pattern is just a repeated uh, hexadecimal A. Um, and then for GCC, I believe it is currently um, repeated uh, hexadecimal F8. Um, and that's supposed to make it obvious, like if I've crashed, oh, I crashed because of an uninitialized variable. Um, and in a similar manner as uh, Clang, or as uh, LTO, we have uh, two configuration options to set whatever mode you, you prefer. Um, I believe that zero, initialization, zero initialization is actually on by default. You can switch to pattern in it if you want, although there are uh, sometimes some more problems that end up coming about from that. This is not a substitution for listening to your uninitialized variable warnings um, because it this, fun, this flag aims to mitigate the security impact of these problems, but it does nothing to fix the logic problems, um, which can still lead to what I just define as unexpected behavior rather than undefined behavior. Undefined behavior is never good. Unexpected behavior is in some cases worse because uh, your code might look correct and might not have any undefined behavior problems, but you might have still written something that doesn't do what you actually want it to do. Um, this option does have a, uh, can have a performance impact because you're initializing variables uh, that may or may not have a different initialization later. Um, and this is especially, uh, this especially happens with pattern initialization. Um, there's a change in Clang 18 to help um, mitigate some of that performance by basically syncing the initialization as close to its use as possible, in which case, if that code, for example, ends up being dead or not used after optimizations, the compiler can just clean it up. Um, there is also the initialized uh, attribute macro um, so that you can actually opt out of this um, automatic initialization on a per variable basis. And then there is also the um, CC option macro in the kernel where you can uh, disable this for an entire translation unit. So you can set the F trivial auto var in it to the uninitialized option, which is what it is by default um, for like a particular unit um, so that you're not uh, having to worry about that problem for, uh, for that. All right, and then the last thing I'm just going to cover kind of briefly here is the uh, static analyzer. So uh, Clang has a separate static static analyzer from the kind of warning, uh, the compile time warnings, um, and that can potentially find more problems than those compile time warnings can. Um, unfortunately, those the warnings that the static analyzer and Clang tidy finds they're often not full compiler warnings because their false positive rate is much higher. They have the ability to maybe do some of that kind of inner procedural inner procedural analysis, like the cross-function analysis. Um, but that kind of runs into the pitfalls of that, like I mentioned with GCC. So you'll often see a much higher rate. Um, Kbuild has two targets that you can run for these um, after you've kind of built all of your code. Um, so there's the Clang, Clang Analyzer target and there's the Clang Tidy target. Um, they just run different checks. That's kind of the main thing that they, that they do. Um, right now, it is very noisy um, because we have not looked into um, we haven't looked into actually what warnings we may or may not want to enable. So, for example, with the compiler, we have gone through and we have looked and see uh, are there any warnings that we want to turn on? Are there any warnings that we need to disable? We haven't done that process with the static analyzer right now. So. You know, there could be warnings that are very noisy that we might not want to turn on for the kernel, and we just haven't, uh, you know, done that just yet. Um, and I would recommend outputting, if you're going to run these targets, I would very much recommend just outputting the, the output to a file. That way you can kind of filter and, and uh, sift through those a little bit easier. Um, I have an example here of one that I actually found um, while writing this yesterday. <laughs> um, so it looks like, you know, in this, this code here, it says, hey, this value that we've stored to the dev variable, it's never actually read. Um, and 
I kind of looked at the code a little bit, um, and I think there's actually a pretty simple fix for this. Um, I'm, I kind of give a, a little hint um, here, and if somebody wants to send a patch for that, I would be happy to review it. Um, And that's all I have. Um, I have uh, some links here to um, the Clean Built Linux issue tracker where we kind of track a lot of the, the meta problems that come up. Um, we have a mailing list on lists.linux.dev. I mean, you can read the archives on war.kernel.org. Um, we're on both the uh, LLVMs Discord and um, Libera IRC. Um, and then we have a bi-weekly meeting um, every two weeks. Um, and I've included a couple of links um, there, so. Um, Nathan, a couple of questions. Looks like yeah. there is one in the chat. Um, this is related to the clean attribute um, error that um, Plank throws out and GCC doesn't. Yeah. And do such improvements get supported in GCC over time? Yes. I mean, we, we, uh, we very much try to make the compilers agree. Like we, we want problems uh, and features to be consistent across both compilers. You know, you, like for example, Google uses Clang everywhere. So for Google, it's really important that Clang has as much priority and feature priority and warning priority as GCC does because they don't use GCC. Um, and then it's the same thing, you know, vice versa is that you might use GCC regularly, but maybe you do want to switch to Clang at some point and you want to make sure that all of those, you, that you're not kind of losing anything for that switch. Um, so yes, I would definitely say that like both, you know, both compilers, you know, try to get all of that, uh, or try to agree on as much stuff as possible. This is just a matter of delays, I guess. One project might, you know, they, delays, they come out too differently. Yeah. Finding people to work on things. Um, so like con kernel control flow integrity right now is a kind of big thing in, uh, you know, the kernel for mitigating those, uh, those ROP attacks and, GCC has, uh, like somebody was working on uh, the implementation for ARM64, you know, changed jobs, wasn't able to pick it back up. I think I saw recently that somebody from RISC-V land is now looking at that. So, you know, it's it's often, you know, it, it's often that we want these things to be supported, but maybe it's just finding, you know, the right people to actually do that and work on it. So, right. and that's why bug reports, bug reports are always important. Absolutely. Um, this is one more question in the uh, Q&A. Is the kernel built by Clang executable on bare metal? Last time I checked LLVM uh, slash Linux, as it was called back in the day, it was only good for static analysis, hadn't even boot properly in a VM. I think we have come long ways from that. Uh, I will let you yeah. feel that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, we can definitely run on bare metal. My workstation that's turning away on uh, here right next to me is, is running a clean built kernel. Um, Android, Chrome OS, all of these uh, products nowadays uh, all run clean built kernels. Um, but yes, you are correct that LLVM Linux was kind of the precursor to clean built Linux, did some uh, work upstream, but uh, there were definitely a lot of problems that had to be tackled before you know, we could get to booting on bare metal. So yes, it, it was definitely uh, it was definitely a, a big effort by a lot of people over the years to get it to, to where it is today. Well, thank you so much, Nathan. Um, I think we are out of time. Oh, there is one question looks like, uh, if that's okay, Candice. Um, Absolutely. Okay. Does LLVM generate more optimized machine code compared to GCC as a user trying to decide on whether to use Clang or GCC for building the kernel? In your opinion, what would you say is the most compelling reason? So at this point, GCC and Clang will generate roughly the same optimized code. Um, there are definitely, uh, you know, cases where like, you know, claim might get this, you know, micro optimization wrong or like GCC does it better. But then there's also cases where it's the same thing around where, you know, LLVM has implemented, you know, a transformation or an optimization that maybe GCC has. And so it can generate more code in that case. I think like for, you know, if, if optimizations are a big thing that you care about and you care about producing an optimized kernel, looking into something like LTO might be, uh, might be useful or be one of the most compelling reasons to, 
to use LLVM because GCC's LTO isn't supported in the current. So like that's one thing where, you know, on a on a general, I think in general, the code and the the optimizations that that happen between the two compilers are largely the same and they're going to produce optimized code. And in some cases, one might be better than the other. Like Pharonix does a lot of um, benchmarking across compiler versions and stuff like that. And you'll often see, you know, maybe GCC is really far this way in one area, LLVM is far in another. It just like, kind of all depends. Um, but I definitely think that like if optimizations are what you care about, I think LTO um, and then soon, hopefully maybe like PGO and stuff like that um, will make it easier for uh, you to produce a even more optimized kernel uh, with LLVM than maybe GCC. Great. I think that's it. That's all we got in, in terms of questions in chat and Q&A. Thank you, Nathan. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Nathan and Shiro, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today, and a copy of the presentation slides will be added to the Linux Foundation website. We hope you are able to join us for future mentorship sessions. Have a wonderful day.